Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar Weekly Discussion Topic video. This one's going to be all about bending, how it's inherited, is it genetic, is it spiritual, that sort of thing. And someone on my YouTube channel suggested I do this video and I thought it was a really good suggestion as it's not really something I've talked about before on my channel. Is it is it spiritual, is it genetic, that sort of thing. So uh, I, I've been pretty excited actually to do this video ever since I got that suggestion. I uh, had to do a little bit of like research, you know, like looking through a lot of the um, characters who had like some clear family trees and like we knew about. Um, and I think I've come to the... I think I, I've put together as best as possible some of the most unique cases and uh, ultimately like I don't think I figured anything out in terms of anything special beyond what I think most people have already like known up to now. But... I think the video should be really interesting. I have a couple of diagrams of family trees and stuff like that, which should be fun to uh, look at as we go through, but um, yeah. I'll start by saying that, like, I think the answer ultimately is both. It is ge bending, in terms of being inherited, is genetic and spiritual, but the spiritual aspect of it, I think, is only used in very specific cases. Like, based on what we know and the various relationships we know in the Avatar world right now, I really think the spiritual thing only really applies to um, airbender stuff so far. And I think I might have one waterbender case where spirituality had an impact on if someone was a bender or not. But in general, I, I would apply most of that primarily to airbender stuff, as I'll get into as we get through go through this video. So... The other um, aspect of spirituality that I think is important to note is that bending as an ability is inherently spiritual because of how humans in the first place got bending. We got it from the line turtles, they gave it to us via energy bending. That's why we have it. A, spirit, a, a somewhat spiritual, physical being, very ancient uh, um, beings, the line turtles, gave it to humans via energy bending, of another very spiritual technique. Um, and that's an important one to note because it's only after we are given, uh, humans are given uh, bending by the line turtles that they are then able to pass it on and we can actually talk about it like we're going to talk about in this video in terms of uh, does a non-bender and non-bender have a non-bender kid or, or a bender kid? Like th that sort of questions. And uh, what, what we know from like early line turtle stuff is basically that the airbenders seem to be allowed to keep their element as just a rule by the their line turtle. Because they tried to live in harmony with the spirits around them, the original airbenders were basically just allowed to keep their ability whereas what we saw with the fire line turtle was that he would gift them the ability for like a little while and then they would have to give it back to him upon returning it was only a, a way to protect themselves while they were outside of the line turtle and it was really only one taking the ability um for good and then jaya and the rest of the people following suit that basically made the first permanent firebenders and then the big event obviously that i think really makes bending it like an important part of humanity in that it is a thing that they pass on genetically from then on out is the era of the avatar starting and the era of the line turtles ending in that they then leave no longer thinking they need to protect the humans but before they leave they seem to gift any human that wants it the ability of uh, bending in that that's why there are so many airbenders waterbenders firebenders earthbenders and so on that just before they leave and effectively disappear from the world they do gift people uh, the ability to protect themselves at least that's what seems to happen and then from there on out we can actually start to figure some stuff out so, uh, some some brief small points I'll cover at the start as, like, rules we're going to go by, I suppose, for this. Um, one, there is one other way that humans gain bending, and that is harmonic convergence. This is another spiritual way that they got bending, and there's a few characters we're going to mention here briefly that got their bending via this way. But right now, all, the only the only known way, um, uh, evidence of this happening is um obviously the the air the people who became airbenders via harmonic convergence and 
that is a very spiritual thing that that seems to have nothing to do with genetics fundamentally it's just that basically the universe saw that there was a a, a very few amount of airbenders in the world and balanced out the number of benders of each element in the world by basically making more people airbenders to keep that technique alive. That's effectively what happened at Harmonic Convergence. So people like Zaheer got the ability, people like Boomi, Opal, and stuff like that. Again, another spiritual way, and it, it sort of hints at, I suppose, Harmonic Convergence, like, almost sending out this, this like, wave of um, energy bending energy that sort of created some benders at times. So that that's pretty interesting. Um, Avatars cannot pass on their non-native elements unless uh, they're unless they, I suppose, uh, create a kid in a relationship with uh, a bender of one of those elements. Uh, that's a kind of complicated way of saying that an avatar can only pass on the element of the basically nation they are born into. So Ang, in terms of what he, what element he can pass on, he can only pass on airbending. The reason he one of his kids is a waterbender is because uh, Ang's wife is Katara, who's a waterbender. That's where the waterbending side of things come from. Ang couldn't just have like a a Ang couldn't have like a firebender kid uh, unless he, it was with a girl who was a firebender. Is effectively the thing to say that the, the an avatar the the only thing they can genetically pass on is basically their element, which is their native element that they are born into, because even though all of the avatars are direct reincarnations of Wan, the first avatar, who was a bender of all four elements, he natively was a firebender, given that that's basically, I assume, where he was born, potentially on the back of that line turtle, and um, that's the first element that he got, and that kind of created the cycle in terms of the order of the way he got his elements, and it, that's just the way it is. So, um, just be aware of that. That an avatar can't pass on any element except their own native element uh, of the element that they're born into. So, Korra wa- Kor can pass on water bending, Kyoshi earth bending, Roku fire, Yang Chen air, and, and so on. That's pretty simple. Um, and uh, yeah, they're the main rules out of the way. So let's get into actually talking about examples. And what we can glean from some of the examples in terms of creating some rules for how we can determine if these two characters have kids, what are their like uh, kids going to be? So, the the main examples are, of course, the, the easy examples to start off with are basically examples of two people who are of the same uh, element, two benders of the same element coming together and having a kids. What do they have? We have examples of uh, two benders of the same element having benders and non and non benders. So, the good example of this is uh, for bender bender having a bender is Tonrock and Senna. Cora's parents having Cora, of course. Tonrock is a water bender. We know that Senna. We don't see her water bend in the show, but it's confirmed outside of the show that she has water bending. So, two waterbenders have Korra, who, you know, is the avatar, but her element is water. She She's a waterbender. It's actually really surprising that we don't have a ton of examples of just two people of the same element having kids. Like, we really don't have that many examples at all. Uh, Tonrock and Senna was basically the only one that came to mind. Like, as we'll get into, like, uh, a lot of them... Either we don't know if one of the people involved in the relationship is a bender or not, but there are not many confirmed cases of two people who are both benders also having a bender. So, Tano Kinsan is an example of that. An example of the opposite, where like two benders uh, have a non-bender, which seems surprising, is Pian Dao. Pian Dao's parents were both firebenders, and very powerful ones at that. And their child was Pian Dao, who was a non-bender, of course, um, and made up for that by being excellent with a sword. So that is an example of like, okay, like the obvious one is that, yes, if someone is a waterbender and their wife is a waterbender, of course their kid would be a waterbender. But then we have this other example where two firebenders who seem to have very strong firebending, 
their child is a non-binary, which seems a bit of a shock, but that just seems in general to be the case, where it's an always a thing between two benders of the same element, where there is a chance that their child is a non-bender. I'd say more than likely, it's 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 it leans more towards uh, the the chances of their child being a bender rather than not. But again, there's not a ton of examples, as I said, of relationships of two people with the same element to really go on. Um, but uh, yeah, let's move on to to uh, non-bender relationships where the the man and woman are both non-benders. Uh, we have examples of both of these. Actually, uh, there, there's a perfect example where there's one of each, and that is um, Hakoda and Kaya, uh, K- Katara and Sokka's parents. You can see from the diagram here um, that this this is a fairly good example of this. Hakoda is a non-bender, Kaya is also a non-bender, and they have two kids, Sokka and Katara. Sokka is a non-bender, first born. Second born is Katara, who is a waterbender, which is very interesting. Now, this is a more this is a much more interesting one to think about, of course, because where does the water bending come from? If Akoda and Kaya both weren't water bending, how on earth do they have a child who is one? Um, it sort of makes sense for, for like two people who are benders to potentially not have one, and that like okay, it just didn't get passed down. But where does the water bending come from? And I think it comes down to the fact that we don't know the full lineage of Hakoda back as far as we as, as exists and, and the same for Kaya I, I I assume that somewhere in Kaya or Hakoda's family tree going really far back there is someone who is a waterbender and that is why Katara even has the possibility to be a waterbender um so that that that's probably something that plays a role here that like Katara uh, Hakoda's like great 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 grandmother or father was a waterbender and because of that, you know, so many uh, like uh, generations have passed that, okay, Qatar is a waterbender now. To some extent, this could be a slightly spiritual thing in the sense of at the time when like Qatar was born, there was no waterbenders in the Southern Water Tribe. And perhaps this was like the universes as like a spiritual thing, way of bringing a waterbender back. But this isn't the example I was referring to earlier Earlier on of an example of a spiritual thing for a be- an element that isn't air. But uh, yeah, this is an example of a non-bender and a non-bender having a non-bender and also having a waterbender. So really interesting stuff there. Um, another example of a non-bender and a non-bender having a non-bender is uh, May, May's parents, uh, Ukano and Michi, uh, both non-benders and they have... Uh, May and Tom Tom, who are both non-benders, and it's also important to note here that May's parents are both basically nobles from the Fire Nation. They're both both come from pretty well thought after lines in the Fire Nation, and they come together and still only have um, uh, non-benders. So that's that's pretty interesting to me, at least. Um, so yeah, there there's some examples of that. I think it becomes a lot more interesting when you then start to bring in the one bender, one non bender relationships and how it starts working out there. Um, so I'll bring up first and for- foremost. Um, I, th- I, th- I think I think I'll go for uh, the Bei Fong family tree here as an example of a bender and a non bender as probably the the, ver- the base example. So uh, this is a, this is a bigger one of the family trees I have here, as you can see here. It's a little more complicated, but I still think it's fairly easy to follow. So Toph's parents are Poppy and Lau. As far as we're aware, they're both non-benders, just based on their characters and the fact that they send their their daughter to be thought by someone else in Earthbending. It, it, very, it makes it very clear that they are not benders. So two non-benders, but both are from the Earth Kingdom. They have a child, and it is Toph. She has Earthbending and the potential to be a very powerful earthbender, which he obviously fulfills with the help of the uh, badger moles. So that's that's interesting in of itself. Non-bender, non-bender, earthbender. It's another example of that kind of unexpected um, bender being born. Um, she has relationships with two different men and has t- uh, daughters with two different fathers, of course. Uh, so she has Lin with a man called Kanto, who we don't know anything about in terms of was he uh, a bender or not, nor what um, con- uh, nation his origins are from. And then 
she has Su Yin with someone who we don't know. We don't know anything about the name or what nation or if he had any bending. All we know is that there are two different fathers and they we can't really say anything about them in relation to how they affect uh, the birth of her two daughters and their bending abilities. But it's interesting to note that both Lin and Sue seem very on par in general. It's mainly their personalities that actually seem a little bit different more so than their bending abilities. Like, Lin seems a bit more, I suppose, in terms of her style, like Toph, whereas Su Yin seems to have a slightly different style, you know, maybe suggesting her father is, very, is a very different person to um, Toph, but their bending abilities are very similar in that they are both very strong earth benders, they are both very strong metal benders, and... Um, but Toph does say neither of them are as good as her, which to some extent I think suggests that Toph being a strong earthbender and I suppose having, being the, basically having strong earth genes or whatever, her basically having children with I suppose what you could perhaps consider to be unknown or potentially weak bloodlines who potentially don't have any bending or anything like that just maybe weakens the kind of bending within someone and so Toph being crazy powerful her daughters are strong really strong but not on Toph's level but um Lin uh, as far as we're aware doesn't have a family though she did I suppose previously have a relationship with um Tenzin but there are no kids from that Su Yin, though, is, is the main example I actually want to talk about here in terms of as, as, as we're going through right now. Earth ben, uh, bender and non-bender relationships. So Su Yin and her husband, Batar Sr., uh, have five kids. Su Yin is an earthbender, of course, um, with a strong uh, kind of earthbender lineage being from being Toph's daughter. Batar Sr. is a non-bender. That's very clear, even though we never get it flat out said to us. Uh, so he's a non-bender, but he's clearly from the Earth Kingdom. Um, so together, they come together and have five children. Two non-benders and three earthbenders. Opal, of course, becomes an airbender later on, but at birth and up until like when we meet her in book three, she is a non-bender. She doesn't have uh, earthbending either. Um, so that's interesting. So effectively, you know, I, I assume if they had had a sixth child, it probably would be a non-bender too. So this is an example of probably like the idea that like basically in a standard, you know, bender non-bender relationship, there's a 50-50 chance basically of their child being a bender or a non-bender. Perhaps because Su Yin uh, obviously has very strong kind of lineage of earthbending with Toph being her mother, it potentially had earthbending be very strong and that's why there are more earthbenders than non-benders. But it, it is notable here that it's the you know, uh, Huan, Wei, Wing are the earthbenders and then Batar Jr. and Opal are the non-benders. And then later on Opal becomes an airbender via harmonic convergence. On the other side of things, we have... Tenzin's family tree. Again, another example of a bender non bender relationship. Tenzin's an airbender with strong airbender lineage going back to Aang and strong bending lineages in, suppose, in, in general because of Katara as well. And then Pema, who is uh, a non bender, but she is an air acolyte. And this is where I'll bring spirituality into things. This is basically the bender non-bender relationship with spirituality example here so uh, Tenzin obviously is spiritual being an airbender he's not the most spiritual person but compared to most people he is super spiritual Pema is spiritual because she's an air acolyte and she follows the same culture as Tenzin and in terms of airbending she just doesn't have airbending so it's an example of a bender non-bender they have four kids three of which are confirmed to be airbenders Jinora, Iki and Milo and then Rohan, uh, their newest child, is assumed to be an airbender. And we say that, and I think it's very likely to be true, because Katara joked, I suppose, to um, Pema when she felt her you know, pregnant stomach that like, I, I could sense another airbender in your future. And I, I doubt they'll do anything to say that Katara's wrong about that prediction. So I think it's it's very highly likely. So for this, for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to assume that Rohan is an airbender, and so they have four kids, four airbenders. But what about the previous example, like Su Yin and Batar Senior? They had three benders and two non-benders. What what's up with that? Why the difference? 
I think the spirituality is the difference in this case. That airbending is a very spiritual um, um, it's the most spiritual of the elements, and both Tenzin and Pema lead spiritual lives. Not to mention the fact that there aren't that many airbenders in the world, and you have, I think, the combination for the fact that when they have kids, they had all airbenders. Even though Pema's not an airbender herself, the fact that she is spiritual and follows the same culture of airbending, I think, makes it so that all of their kids are airbenders. So I think spirituality plays a huge role in why this is the case. Um, but as we'll get into with the next example, uh, there is some complications to this as well. And that example would be Ang and Katara's family. Now, Ang is spiritual. He's an airbender. Katara, you know, I wouldn't say he's the most spiritual person, but I think she's kind of open to it in that sense. Um, and they have three children. They have Bumi, Tenzin, and Kaya. Bumi's a non-bender um, until harmonic convergence. Tenzin's an airbender. And Kaya is a waterbender. Why doesn't airbending take over in this case as well? It's a spiritual thing. Katara you know, isn't spiritual, but, you know, uh, could be. Um, why isn't airbending a big thing? Or why do they have a non-bender? I, I think it's one of those cases where here, the fact that Katara isn't spiritual means that they're not all airbenders. It, that's that's probably the, the main thing, that because she's from her own culture, that somewhat clashes with the tendency for airbending to wants to kind of take over so the kind of clash of those two makes it so that it's just even that like airbending just becomes another element and the spirituality isn't that big of a deal anymore and it's just comes down to like the standard rules that seem to be in, in place for for bending inheritance where um uh, when two benders of different elements come together their child can either be the father's element the mother's element or a non-bender and that's exactly what happens here in the three times that I and Katara have children. We get a non-bender, we get an airbender, and we get a waterbender. But obviously, later on, because of harmonic convergence, Bumi becomes an airbender. So, very interesting examples here of how spirituality affects certain things, but doesn't affect other things. Um, the other example um, of waterbending I'll build up to now, uh, with one of the other, I suppose interesting dynamics and that being uh, what if uh, two people have twins what if they give birth to twins now we have a couple of we have two examples of twins in the avatar world and no uh, that we know they're bending and stuff like that so first up we have this image here from the For fortune teller episode 14 of atla book one water uh, it's these two um, earth kingdom boys and this is obviously from the fortune teller uh, they're there are, the team avatar basically ask, okay, we need all the, we need all the earthbenders to help uh, build like uh, channels for the volcano to stop that from causing damage, and these two boys speak up and they basically say, "I'm a bender, I'm not." So one of them is an earthbender, one of them isn't, but they are clearly twins. How is this the case? And what's the other example? The other example is Eska and Desna. They are twins. They're both waterbenders, pretty powerful waterbenders. What's the difference? Uh, so there's no rules for twins where they both have to be, not where like it's it, where it's always the case that both twins have the same bending. It's absolutely not. It seems like it's it's again kind of random. It's just they're they're almost like treated as two separate. Even though they're even though twins in general are so similar, they're still treated like separately when it comes to determining their bending. And that we have a an example of a non-bender bender pair of twins, and then two benders pair of twins uh, as well as I, I assume a two non-bender pair of twins with Lo and Lee but I don't know if we have full confirmation if they are or are not benders themselves um, but uh, yeah so I think that's basically a, an example of each of the different options for bending uh, with twins and um, so it seems that it's, it, they are just treated like kind of separate things like, like kind of Katara and Aang if they had had twins it it what it wouldn't have necessarily been the case where they would both be waterbenders, both be um, airbenders, or both be nonbenders. We could have got a mix of any of them. We, they could have had a nonbender and an airbender, a waterbender and a nonbender, or or whatever. So twins don't seem to have much of an effect on things. And um, going back to Eska and Desna, I think this is an example potentially 
of spirituality affecting their bending in that Unalak, their father, was a very spiritual person. Um, and there's, I suppose, the implication that he really wanted to have the Avatar as his child, but obviously they didn't turn out to be the Avatar, but he had twins and both of them were waterbenders, which they're the only example of twins who both have bending, so maybe that suggests some sort of a spiritual element. Their mother, Melina, we don't know if she was a bender or not, so that's a kind of hard example to really uh, talk about. But um, still, very interesting stuff. Um, now, um, how many more examples do I have here? I'm just looking through my list. Um, let's talk about Mako and Bolin's family tree here. You can see here. Uh, their their father is San, and he's from the Earth Kingdom. And then their mother is Nauki, and she is from the Fire Nation. We don't know if either of them or just one of them is Benders or not. All we know is that they're... You know, they met in Republic City, but we do know where their origins are from. Which, this is going to be a fascinating thing if the Avatar universe continues and we continue to get stories into the future. As the nations begin begin to become more together and um, less separated nation by nation, you are going to get more complicated relationships like this where two non-benders potentially don't have the greatest connection to to their nation of origin. So they could have end up having pretty surprising children in the sense of like you could get like non-bender people who have basically airbender kind of origins and um, but them being so far removed from that that they they have airbenders. So it, it's interesting in, in the sense of like if San just grew up in Republic City and wasn't necessarily aware too much of his past coming from the Earth Kingdom like you you could have a surprise where he was he he gave birth to an earthbender it's just a an interesting thing going forward where it's not always going to be the case that if we find a non-bender in the earth kingdom that they necessarily have earth kingdom origins anymore it's, it's stuff like the promise and uh, uh Corey's parents being a prime example of that uh, someone from the earth kingdom and the fire nation coming together similar to this relationship but a little bit different in that Corey was a non-bender but uh, here Obviously, it's someone from the Earth Kingdom, someone from the Fire Nation coming together. And two, I, I'm, for this, I'm going to assume that they're non-benders because they were killed by firebenders and they didn't mention like them fighting back or anything like that. And they seemed like they just kind of had normal, fairly normal jobs and stuff like that. So, for the sake of discussion on this family tree, I'm going to assume that San and Naoki are both non-benders. So, two non-benders, both from different nations, having children. And they give birth to... Mako and Bolin, a firebender and an earthbender, both of which are really powerful benders as well. Mako can generate lightning, redirect lightning, and Bolin is actually a special bender in that he can use lava bending. So uh, to me, that's super interesting that, you know, as one of our only examples of non-benders from different nations having bender children that their their children turned out to be super powerful benders. Um it just uh, further goes to tell that there 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 are certain rules to the way this works but they're not super exact. You can get fairly odd situations like this I suppose where like it seems very unlikely but Malcolm Bolin end, end up being two of the most powerful benders in Korra. And um, so uh, yeah there's that. Um, not not too much else to say about that um, uh, relationship, just because we don't know that much about San and uh, Naoki. Uh, last one I want to talk about, uh, and I suppose I've basically covered most of the stuff I want to talk about here. This one's just going to be more about bloodlines and how they kind of come together and potentially help to determine bending and stuff like that. I talked about it a little bit during the Toph family tree and that she's a very powerful earthbender and maybe descendants of her have a higher likelihood to have earthbender children because of like the strength of the kind of uh, bending in their blood Um, uh, and a brief example I suppose just before getting into this big one is probably Yakone and his children in that he is a special bender like Bolin but his is with uh, psychic blood bending the ability to blood bend uh, without the use of the full moon his wife as far as we're aware is a non-bender she's a water tribe woman and they gave birth to two children, um, the uh, Noatok and Tarlock, both of whom were waterbenders, both of whom inherited um, Yakone's ability of psychic bloodbending, 
one more so than the other but i think that's more of a personal thing between the two characters in that um tarlock's personality meant that he was um wasn't as uh, strong in it as as his brother but he still could use the technique so that again that's an example of i think just the power the sheer power that yukon has taking prime example in terms of determining what their kids were in that they both inherited it where as for me like if yukon had had a non-bender child it would have been it would have seemed kind of weird that his power didn't transfer over that to some extent his power is so unique and powerful that it it almost has to be transferred over when he has a child um so that's an interesting one but uh we'll talk this is the the more in-depth example here and this is the fire nation royal family tree and i suppose also roku's family tree as well and how they eventually come together at the end uh leading with azula and zuko now obviously we can follow zuko's family tree down a little bit further but because we don't know who the mother is just yet even though i I do really heavily think it is may but um we're not sure just yet but even so i I don't think there's a whole lot to say about zuko may izumi uh, in terms of this discussion so the key thing here is that these are two very powerful bloodlines of firebenders the uh the royal family tree basically of sozin uh very powerful firebenders and then roku the avatars uh uh, uh f- family lineage of course um and this one's pretty interesting because the the key thing is ozai and ursa coming together and having azula and zuko and the the, the main discussion topic i want to bring up here is the fact that these two were put together in an arranged marriage because of a decision made by Azulon, o- Ozai's father, wanting to purposefully have Ozai in, arranged, in an arranged marriage with someone from a strong bloodline. And so they specifically sought out a descendant of Roku, hoping that Ozai and this uh, woman's uh, children would be super powerful benders and continue the strong line of uh, the royal family. Which ultimately happened, um, to some degree, in that Azula and Zuko are very powerful. But it is a really good example of the fact that, as we'll, as I'll go through in just a minute, you know, you have two very powerful lines come together. And even though Ozai is the firebender and Ursa coming from a strong line, but herself not being a bender, they do still have two firebenders as their children. I think that's a really interesting kind of concept. So let's go through it. Uh, the easiest side, of course, is the Sozin side. So Sozin and his wife, and again, I'm making a lot of assumptions in this family tree in that uh, I'm assuming Sozin's wife is a non-bender. I'm assuming Azulon's wife, Ela, is a firebender. Is a non-bender, I mean, sorry. And I'm also assuming Tomin, Rina, Jinzuk, Norin, and Ki are all non-benders. Um, I'm pretty confident about like all of them being non-benders just because I think we probably would have had it mentioned if they were. But I don't think it'll affect too much stuff. Um, the, the 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 people who are firebenders are 100% confirmed on this uh, thing, which is the most important part. But yeah, Sozin and his wife have Azulon. Azulon and his wife have Iroh and Ozai, who are both firebenders. So that's interesting in of itself. Um, Iroh has a child with an unknown woman, and they have Luten, who, again, we don't know if Luten is a firebender or not, so we can't really talk that much about it. That's why I didn't include it on this part of the, on this specific diagram. Um, and then they have Ozai, Ozai is there as well, so he and Urza have a relationship, and they have Azula and Zuko. But uh, let's go back up to Roku, and uh, Roku's line is the more interesting one, I think, just to talk about, and that it just makes sense. The royal family blood is strong and firebending, lightning generation and stuff like that. Of course, the firebending would tend to continue to go down, even if they're in relationships with women who aren't, or who are non-benders, but firebending continues. Roku's one is, is interesting in that, in, that, in that it seems like there's a, te- there's a tendency for there to be a lot of non-benders in this family, but ultimately in the end create powerful firebenders regardless. In that Roku is basically the only firebender on this side of the family tree. Uh, so Roku and his wife Tamin have uh, Rina, their daughter, and uh, she has a relationship with uh, this man called Jinzuk, and they have a child called Ursa. Rina and Jinzuk, I think, are both non-benders in the sense that Rina just kind of ran a herbal herbal shop, a herb shop, I mean, sorry, and they didn't seem to use their firebending if they had it. Jinzuk, we don't know a lot about, but he, he helped with the shop, so I, I think because of that, they, they 
it's very easy to assume that they aren't firebenders. But yeah, Ursa then has relationships with two different men and has kids with uh, each of them. Uh, with Norin, who's a non-bender as well, because I think it would have been... They would have made it very clear if he was a non-bender because he was fighting against Ozai, and he specifically used a weapon rather than firebending, so I think it's very, very certain that he is a, specifically a non-bender. So Ursa and Norin have a child called Kii, and Kii, I think, is very clearly a non-bender as well. So that, that's that's interesting in of itself, that with Norin, the the what tends to be highlighted here is the non-bender side of things that even though ursa comes from a strong line related to roku she doesn't have a firebender with norin yet in her other relationship with ozai they come together and even though again ursa is a non-bender here the two bloodlines come together and cre- and they have two f- really strong firebender children azula and zuko and it it just seems to be this kind of situation where the strength of the royal bloodline ten like almost drew out the um, strength of Ursa's bloodline whereas with Norin who is just a kind of seemingly random person from the Fire Nation just a random town it just tended to like okay Ursa's a non-bender I'm a non-bender we have a non-bender child like the the fact that she's from roku's lineage doesn't seem to be that big of a thing in that relationship but the strength of the other bloodline strengthened hers and the two came together very effectively with azula and zuko who you know uh, are both characters who are effectively struggling with the same thing of just having this mixed lineage of two very powerful lines who are a conflict with each other at one point uh, there's not a ton to say, but it, this one is more more to establish the idea of like bloodlines overlapping and like the strength of one bloodline continuing throughout just because of the strength of it and the potential for like you know not maybe fulfilling the strength of your bloodline and stuff like that. Um, so it, it's it's really interesting stuff, absolutely. But. Um, I think that's about all I want to talk about. Let me just check my notes here. Um, yeah, I think I basically covered everything. Um, at least everything I could think of. So, I'm, go- I'm just going to end it here. In the comments, if there are any specific relationships, children, people's bending and stuff like that you want to ask me about that I didn't cover in this video, absolutely leave a comment in the in the comment section below and I will do my best to answer it as best as I can. Because I, I, I couldn't have covered everything that you guys want me to cover in this one video. So uh, yeah, leave the, leave those in the comments below. But uh, for now, I'm going to end this video. Uh, I suppose also in the comments, let me know what you want the next uh, weekly discussion topic video to be about. But uh, for now, that's been the video. Thanks for watching, and bye.